Justin, what do you say today? We talk about uh, some real estate investing. Of course. Maybe go over some things that people would want to know about different types of properties they could invest in, some pros and cons. Yeah. A lot of content. Yes. Could be a little bit long. We uh, Justin tend to be over, over explainers. Tend to be a little wordy, <laughs> but but actually we feel that that's a good thing. We're yeah. all about education for people getting them started on uh, the path of home ownership yeah first and then eventually get them on the path of uh, real estate investing because it's been so powerful and it's been so powerful for us in our own mm-hmm. lives and for yeah. our own balance sheet yeah so strap in buckle up let's uh, let's get started it's gonna be fun <laughs> I think the main, one of the key principles today is to just have an open mind about different types of real estate and be willing to evaluate each property, each opportunity on its merit. Yeah. I mean, everything's on the table as far as I'm concerned. I mean, there's been times when you and I have talked about investing where we think, wow, we never really want to own that kind of property. And and then our minds are opened and, and we're enlightened a little bit more. And, and so even for us, everything's still on the table. I still have preferences of what I'd sure. like to put uh, my money into. Yeah. And uh, I can make a strong case, I think, for just about any type of property out there. Yeah. But we've seen in our own portfolio, and we've certainly seen in uh, the portfolios of our investors, how they've won with every different kind of property that we're going to yeah. talk about today. Yeah. I think probably over our, you know, starting to become a lengthy career, we've missed the boat on some properties it's probably and passed on some opportunities. Because we sort of had a closed mindset. Yeah. 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 So I think that's one of the things that we want to focus in on today is just have an open mind as we go through the pros and cons of these different type of, types of properties. Um, evaluate each one based on the numbers and right. based on uh, the positives. So, right. you know, let's talk about condos, townhomes. What have condos and townhomes done? In our market in the last few years. Well, that's really uh, that's really an interesting question because it used to be um, it used to be that condos and townhomes were a lifestyle choice because for about the same price you could have bought an older home. I mean, it wouldn't have been a fancy home, but you could have bought a single family yeah. residence for the same price as a condo or townhome. So it used to really be a a lifestyle choice. Do I want to have the yard work? Do I want to have uh, the exterior maintenance? Yeah. Um, and, and it still is a lifestyle choice. In fact, it, it maybe even more so it's a lifestyle choice because people are busy and they don't want that kind of headache in their life. But um, it it's a different choice now. It's a little more budgetary. Yeah, it's economics. It's a little more economical to buy a condo or a townhome because that's really yeah. all there is. So, for example, in the 170 to 220 range, that's all you're going to get is a, is a really nice condo or maybe an entry-level townhome, right? Yeah, I mean, I I just was down at uh, uh, development Dr. Horton did where we just uh, sold one yeah. down there, and our clients are going to close next week. And those things have just, I mean, they just sell themselves. They wish they had five hundred more units right, right there. Right. So yeah, that's a nice. The, the value of condos and townhomes has gone up tremendously. Now we've got some of our investor clients who that's really their cup of tea. They like the condos and townhomes because there are a couple of pros. Number one, they're a maintenance-free exterior. Um, you know, the HOA is going to take care of wind damage, hail damage, problems with the roof, problems with the siding. They're going to take care of uh, the lawn care, sprinkler yeah. systems, and things like that. I can't tell you how much, especially this time of year, we're shooting this podcast in the middle of the summer. It's super hot. Grass yeah, tends to dry out. out burned out or sometimes people are watering it and it's growing so much they can't keep on top of it. Sprinkler systems are going out. Mm -hmm. You know, so a lot of our investors are paying quite a bit of money to fix those kinds of problems with the the landscaping. And then the other things I mentioned with roofing and exterior features on the home. As you mentioned, one of the pros is the amenities that are available. And so, yeah, that's great as a homeowner, but it also is attractive to a potential tenant. Yeah. So if you're investing in that, you can advertise this rental as having access to a clubhouse, weight room, 
pickleball court. You know, that's <laughs> There's a, a big, new community, yeah. a big amenity now in yeah. some of these communities. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, green space and things like that for your tenants to enjoy. And tenants are very attracted to that. So those are some good pros to condos and townhomes. Now, there are a few cons, and I think they definitely are worth mentioning and something you've got to be aware of if you're going to invest in a homeowner association. Well, there's no doubt about it. I mean, <clears throat> anytime you uh, buy a property in an HOA, a homeowner association, or if it's a commercial property, because remember, cur- commercial properties are also in HOAs in many cases. We call yeah. it a POA, Pro- property, a property owner association. Owner association. Yeah. And so uh, there's a couple things you need to know. You're giving up some control. In fact, some of these associations, when it comes to investing in these particular communities, have become very aggressive yeah. on, on allowing the number of rentals that can be uh, that can be used as rentals. Because, you know, when you resell these condos, and the HOA is there to protect values. Yeah, that's one of the they things that an purpose. HOA does. And uh, protecting values is a serious business. And and one of the things that they really want to talk about is. We need to protect the integrity of the community, and they believe, and so do lenders. This is one of the indications that they use. How many owner occupants versus yeah. rental occupied units are there? And uh, there is some. There are some magic equations that lenders use to determine if this is a lendable property. If you lose financing, in particular FHA financing, which is where a lot of first time home buyers yeah. uh, are going, um, if you lose that ability, you're in a lot of you're in a lot of problems. I mean, it becomes a non warrantable condo, and then you're well, looking at... Uh, e- even a worst-case scenario, and we saw this with some of our investors in 2006, 2007, they invest in some condos, and then suddenly there was no financing right. available at Belmont, yeah. for example, in well, Provo. And so what did that do to the values of that the property? And, I mean, and, it went way down because only cash buyers could... Right. Buy those. Well, and people come to us all the time. Should I buy something that's, you know, that's what, what you would probably refer to as BYU approved, is BYU contracted housing. And remember, BYU contracted housing, housing was built not for owner occupants ever. So when we talk about ratios in a BYU contracted community, it, the owner occupancy is virtually zero. Yeah. And so those had to become cash only sales for a few years. And still today, those are hard to finance with anything yeah. less than 20, 25% down. That's usually through a credit union. So that's one of the big cons I think is difficult to fi- difficulty financing. There's rules and regulations in HOAs. They can yeah. fine you. There's fees that are going up, especially in those communities that are really amenity intense. Uh, it's hard to control those fees very hard to control those fees well not only are the the, the fees on a monthly basis coming up they can also um, decide to assess each yeah. owner and so you know we've been involved with a lot of homeowners associations um, you know here's an example uh, we had an HOA where the uh, uh, each owner was assessed something like uh, oh, fifteen hundred dollars or two thousand dollars because they had to redo some sewer lines. I mean, this was an older community. But if you have a roof that needs to be redone and the HOA hasn't been saving money for that, yeah. stairways is a really common thing. They can hit you with an assessment. So as an investor, all of a sudden where you were cash flowing on that, yeah. you now have this assessment that could very well absorb all of your uh, profit for that year. So those fees and those assessments can be a little bit scary. And, and, and then the volatility in the policies. Yeah. Things can change. Things can change. I mean, you you don't, first of all, you don't want to buy into a condo association, a townhome association, or even a single family uh, uh, community that has a homeowners association without really understanding the rules relating yeah. rentals. And, and people do all the time. Yeah. Well, even in our own portfolio, just to emphasize the assessments, uh, when we owned those um, uh, commercial condos on Orem Boulevard, yeah. uh, that HOA was not being well run. And uh, when it came time to repay the parking lots, they yeah. asked, we owned two units in there. They, I think they assessed us, assessed us four thousand dollars or something like yeah. that uh, between the two of them. That was very very expensive, and that that's a that's another point. When you look at buying into an HOA community, you have every right to look at uh, the minutes of the last HOA meetings, their budgets. Yeah. Um, you just start digging into how that's being run. Is it professionally managed or is it being run by the homeowners themselves? Many of these communities have turned to a professional management company. But you have every right to thoroughly investigate that HOA, and you should. Nobody yeah. does. Yeah. Very few people do, but uh, very important. Yeah. And so, I mean, we don't want to go, again, we don't want to dive too deep into this. There's yeah. a lot more we could talk about on each yeah. section. But in the interest of time, um, let's move on to um, 
I let's, mentioned this. BYU let's contract. talk about BYU contracted housing <laughs> just briefly. <laughs> okay. Because okay? that's almost a different podcast. We have two major universities right here within, I don't know what, eight miles of each other. Yeah. Brigham Young University, private university. We have the youngest population in America in this county yeah. on average. And then we have uh, Utah Valley University, which is growing tremendously. I yeah. mean, they have an enrollment of over, I think, 35,000 uh, students. So we have a lot of student housing. Now, BYU contracted housing is specific for BYU undergraduate students. They have to live in what's called BYU contracted housing. Mm -hmm. And so they have to sign a BYU lease. In that lease is contained an honor code. And so that... Um, that With that comes some different issues that we need to be aware of as landlords. Yeah. Um, some of the pros, I guess, of BYU housing is you're supporting the university and the community and, and providing housing for students. And if, if that's important to you, you, maybe you're an alumni or something like that, that's great. And then I've never had to use the university mediation services, but they will withhold, and maybe I haven't checked for a little while, but they will withhold their transcripts, the student's transcript, if they've got some sort of an issue with a previous landlord. So the landlord can go to the off-campus housing uh, department and talk through maybe some issues they had with a BYU student. Right. But cons, again, most of these are going to be uh, in HOA, so there could be some difficult financing. High turnover, I mean, BYU, right, turnover. a lot of people are coming into Provo at the end of August or middle of August. They're leaving Provo, and we BYU actually uh, ends their semester early at the end of April. They leave to go do internships or go home. And so yeah. you oftentimes are having vacancies come up more frequently, higher turnover. Um, BYU kids, sometimes they serve missions for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they can actually get out of a contract based on that. Yeah. Uh, kids have no prospects of marriage in September, and then by <laughs> December, they're already you know engaged and getting married, and so they want out of their contract. So we used to do quite a bit of BYU contracted housing management, and um, we've kind of gotten away from that just because of some of this extra well, remember, stuff. Remember, these, these, uh, all of the occupants in the BYU contracted housing unit are on separate contracts. Yeah. And that makes it difficult. So you may have a, a, a condo that's owned for four kids, and yeah. you have four different contracts, four different headaches, in my opinion. You get a lot of helicopter parents. This is the first place that their kids have, you know, wow. lived, and you get, you know, parents calling yeah. from California and they're screaming because you want to let their daughter out of a lease because she's getting married. And we've yeah. had all of these yeah. headaches. Let me tell you. But yeah. the bottom yeah. line is, why would you invest in BYU contracted housing? We actually asked the off-campus housing director this uh, a few years ago in a meeting, we did. And, he, and he basically said, "I don't know. I'm not sure why you would, other than you want to support the university." Or maybe you have three or four kids that could be coming to BYU. And we have worked with families like that yeah. who, who have three or four kids that are hopefully BYU bound and you uh, buy the property. Maybe their son or daughter is living in the property right. and renting it to two other people. Yeah. So, so there could be some value in doing that. But as a whole, as people come to us and say, hey, we, I want to invest in real estate to help me get my portfolio going, we're not putting them in BYU contracted no. housing. Okay, probably spent too much time on that, but you know, well, it's a question that's, we get all the time. We get asked that all the time, and uh, people it are aware. But... People are aware of the uh, the amount of student housing we have in this valley. Now, student housing in general could also be a good investment. Yeah. Um, we're not going to go into that necessarily, but um, you know, providing housing for students can certainly provide a nice return. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to multi-units. Now, when we're talking about multi-units, we're talking about one to four units, right. right? This is a totally different discussion when we start talking about six, 12, 16, 48 right. plexes, you know, things like that. Totally different uh, discussion on that. But some of the, you know, uh, duplexes, um, triplexes, fourplexes, we've got a lot of those that were built over the over the past I don't know, three or four decades in this valley to, to provide student housing and then provide more affordable housing. Right. 
So what are some of the pros of uh, those kinds of properties? I mean, well, you've sold a lot of those in your career, yeah, yeah. both to investors and to owner occupants. But I mean, tell me about some of the pros there. Well, I mean, if, for example, our loan officer, Keith Snow, who's been with us for 18 years, he loves fourplexes. He owns two, uh, two fourplexes. Kind of his cup of tea. It's, he likes them because if you have a vacancy, one of those four units is vacant, those other three units are still going to make the payment just fine. In fact, I think he still cash flows even if he's had uh, one of them or even two of them. So in that respect, you it would be, it would be so rare. I would almost say never would you have a, a fully you'd vacant have to, You'd have to really be falling asleep on managing that property <laughs> so to allow that to happen. You'll never have to shoulder that entire payment. I think that is a pro. It is. Absolutely. Sure. And boy, it's sure easy to find tenants uh, at 800 850 a unit. Yeah, they just they're moving in on top of each other. Yeah, I mean the demand for for these smaller units, these more affordable units, is uh, very very high, and so. And and it's always fun on the, to manage these fourplexes or duplexes because we're always upping the rent, and we can never do anything drastic on those. But if you go twenty after one year, you go twenty five fifty dollars. Remember it, when you start increasing those rents. Uh, it increases the value of the property because the value is completely tied upon what they rent for yeah. the whole property itself. Yeah, and I think that's a big pro of multi-units. And, and that becomes even more powerful as you move up in the number of units, right? Yeah. So right. as we increase changes. our net operating income on these properties, the value uh, of that property goes up. So yeah. when, we, when we went through the downturn, yeah, we saw some duplexes and fourplexes, uh, you know, in some cases, uh, maybe depreciate a little bit. That was more a factor of maybe the owner's economic situation or poor management. Yeah. But at the same time, we also saw um, these properties go up because rents increased. And where we saw single family homes, you know, kind of go down like this and maybe a more sharper decline, we didn't see such a decline right. in these properties because... It's not a, it's, it doesn't depend on what the property down the street sold for, yeah. like a single family home. It depends on how much net operating income right. is coming in on that property. And so I think that's a real pro. Yeah. It's a little more insulated, insulated from economic downturns. Yeah. All right, the cons, because man, I see a lot of cons with multi-units. Uh, the cons for me, from a management standpoint, from an owner standpoint, you have four refrigerators and four stoves and four microwaves and four furnaces, water heaters, ACs. I mean, at any given time, something's gonna go out. There's probably rarely a month or maybe a, a quarter where you're not gonna have some pretty significant updating to do on those systems. Possibly. I mean, that's, uh, you, you know, you have to replace a water heater and a furnace in one year. That's likely the entire yeah. uh, amount that you cash flowed for the whole year. Yeah. So there, there is some exposure there. Uh, you know, another thing is, too, that's, you know, always irritating. I, I never want to pay utilities for tenants. Right. Uh, tenants, and this is human nature, when they're not paying the utility, they're and in, and I'm talking about all the utilities because there are a lot of non-conforming properties that are around yeah. this area and other areas where it wasn't really built maybe as a fourplex or a duplex, but later converted. And so you have shared utilities. Yeah. And so if you're paying the gas bill or the electrical bill or the water bill, people are taking really long showers. The AC is super frigid in the summertime. They're cranking up the heat in the wintertime. They don't care about conserving on the utility costs. Yeah, in fact, our sister, uh, she owned a fiveplex just south of BYU, and uh, that was the case. It was an old Victorian home yeah. that had been cut up to five units. Yeah. And that's what we call, it was legal, it was recognized by the city, but it's a legal non-conforming. Right. And I don't necessarily have a problem with legal non-conforming properties. It's better to have a legal conforming properties, meaning that this property is built for, as a duplex, and that if it were to burn down, the city would uh, would uh, grant a That's rebuild a letter, yeah. which is important for financing a rebuild yeah. letter, meaning that you could rebuild this as a duplex. Had that fiveplex burned down, it probably wouldn't have gotten the ability it, to it rebuild it as a fiveplex. Yeah, it may not have been. That's, That's a really a big, good point. Big difference, but um, utilities are important because on these fourplexes and duplexes, in almost every case that I know of, the owner is going to have the water sewer garbage in their name. Yeah. Yeah. And in a legal nonconform, you might have power, gas, water, sewer, garbage in your name. Yeah. And then you have to try to sell to a tenant 
man, the rent seems really high, Mr. Landlord. And the landlord says, well, that's because I'm including all your, yeah. Yeah. and, and it, you'd think in, in a tenant's mind that would make sense, but sometimes it doesn't. They just see that high rent. They do. And we manage a lot of properties that, uh, that where the utilities are included because of this issue. And you do have to explain and, you know, we have to advertise it appropriately. But, uh, you know, we, you, but with that being said, you can charge back these tenants you need to be. Uh, the, the utilities. Good management and, requires that. Yeah, good management requires that. You can come up with a formula or a, a, you know, an equation to, to, to generate a, a bill to the, to the tenant. But you know, again, having more utilities is just some more management responsibilities in, in your, on your plate. Well, you talked about high ten, uh, tenant turnover in BYU contracted housing, and that's certainly the case here in multi-units. Uh, yeah. when, when I was first married, I actually lived in a, a fourplex with my wife, and we were there for one year. Yeah. And that was it. Time to go. Well, because the, these the people that live in fourplexes, a lot of times are pretty mobile. And again, in this valley, a lot of them are students. And so you know, six months to a year is about all you get out of them. And every time you have a turnover, that costs money. Mm -hmm. And so turnovers can be a con for uh, for some of these multi-unit properties. Now, large down payments. The reason why I'm saying that is because, yeah, that's you true. know, what's a, what's a fourplex going right now in Utah County, for example? <laughs> you know, the brick ones where you got two up, two down. And they've built hundreds of What does of that cost? About 550 Wow. Isn't that unbelievable? And those yeah. units are renting for about eight fifty yeah. a piece. Yeah. That's so, twenty five percent is what lenders want to see down yeah. on those on properties, those and they're good loans. But um, you're going to get a little bit higher interest rate on those, yeah. and twenty five percent down of uh, you know even four hundred thousand. That's a hundred thousand dollars. A little harder to get into. So these things. five hundred thousand would be what one hundred twenty five thousand something like that. So for some investors starting out, it's just hard to accumulate a $125,000 down payment uh, where you might be able to more quickly get into a, a single family home or a townhome or something like that. Yeah, right. Okay. All right. Should we move on to single family homes? Yeah, let's not. Again, there's well, more we could talk about with multi-unit. But and, and, and just so you know, Jared and I have a, a lot of different pieces of property in our own portfolio. I think we're pretty well diversified. But we love single family homes. We just yeah. love owning single family homes. Why? Well, you know, I, I think it has a lot to do with the management that's required to own, right. let's say, a single family home versus a fourplex. Yeah. Um, you know, going back to fourplexes, you got yard care, you've got snow removal, you've got Those utilities. Are owner expenses. Those are owner expenses that you have to factor in and budget mm -hmm. for and, and analyze as you're contemplating buying a property. With single family homes, in most cases, we're putting the lawn care responsibilities and the snow removal responsibilities and raking up leaves and things like that on the tenant. Right. That's part of their lease agreement and that's to be expected. That's nothing unusual. They expect that if they're going to own a, you know, rent a single family home, that they're going to have those kinds of responsibilities. Right. Now, we generally have experienced higher quality tenants in our single family homes. Yeah. We've had, you know, our share of uh, crummy tenants in single family homes sure. for sure. But a lot of these people are, um, you know, we rent to a lot of people that are professionals mm -hmm. that are renting only because they just moved here. Right. Um, they uh, have a little sense of pride in where they live. Mm -hmm. They their kids are going to school where the house is, uh, attending church and that sort yeah. of thing. And so we get a little bit higher quality of tenant than say uh, maybe a more affordable unit or right. something that's in a fourplex. Well, and I'll tell you, I look in my beautiful East Orem neighborhood. I live along Palisade Drive. And we have uh, three or four rentals in our area. And those people have been in those homes. I've been in my home for 11 years. We built it uh, in 2008. Yeah. Those people predate us. And they're still living there because, and we'd be we'd be so sad if they moved because yeah. we just love them and they love us and, and they their kids are in the schools and they're active in our church and they're active in the community, et cetera. So people put down roots when they find a yeah. nice single family. You know, there's a mentality among some people. They just want to be renters. I know a lot there's of people a who movement. are renting who could definitely be buying Absolutely. a house. Absolutely. We rent to them all the time. We get people yeah. with fantastic credit scores. They've got you know money in the bank, but they want to rent. Yeah. And we love those kinds of people. And a lot of times those people 
rent single family homes in nice neighborhoods and they want to be a part of the community. Sure. Yeah. So I love that about single family homes. Yeah. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the fewer turnovers you can have, the better because it's expensive to it turn is, over a property. Especially on a single family. It's expensive even if somebody's moving in within a week of somebody moving out. There's still turnover costs. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, if we can p- keep people in there long term, now we're obviously raising the rents and yes, evaluating yeah. market rents and things like that on a yearly basis. That's a discussion for another day. Yeah. So we're not just signing a lease and five years later, it's the same price. Right. Um, single family homes, and again, Utah, our culture, and, and this is certainly applies in other places, but our culture is to uh, have the house with the white picket fence, yeah. you know, not sharing a wall with somebody, not super high density. You, you know, we, we like yards. We like uh, uh, having that, that, that space. That lifestyle. And so, quite, so as a result, demand for single family homes has always been very high. Yeah. And so we've seen really good appreciation rates on single family homes. Yeah. In our own portfolio, I mean, we've been very lucky to buy things back in, you know, let's say 2008, 2009 that. Uh, yeah, we've hit several. That, that one, uh, the, the house with the big shop is almost doubled in value. It, it has, yeah. And uh, we should do a podcast just on that house. Yeah, we can. <laughs> well, and that's another thing. We love to own interesting homes. Yeah. I think we've got some really just unique properties. The one he's referring to has a 1,700 square foot shop It's actually 2,000 square foot 2, shop. 2,000 square foot shop in the back. And we've, had, mechanics some awesome, pit and we've had some awesome tenants over the years. Anyway, um, I, I think the appreciation opportunities have been really good. Yeah. And I think you can, you can force appreciation a lot of times in these properties. So with a condo townhome, you could really doll that up. But right. it's not going to sell for a lot more than the one two doors down That's sold point. for. Yeah, And the same thing with multi-unit. Yes, there are some great strategies you can do to value add, to, to add value to a multi-unit property. But again, it goes back to that income and your expenses and yeah. figuring out what your net operating income is. On a single family home. Yeah, when you resell it, there's a lot of emotional triggers that you can pull. And sure. so, for example, if you're trying to attract a buyer, you spend, you know, a thousand bucks in the front yard or on the front of the home and yeah. and, and some labor and, and materials. I mean, you could probably increase the value of that home five to ten thousand yeah. just just by manipulating the curb appeal alone. Well, we are all so about exciting. fixing up homes and uh, with our own investments, we tend to keep them in really good shape. A lot yeah. of um, people that we work with, investors, um, you know, they're maybe not as proactive in uh, right in uh, fixing some things up but you can uh, you can really build some equity yeah. into into these properties yeah. now resell is super easy on a single yeah. family home i mean if you and i needed to get out of some of our rental properties well part of that is we could be out of in 45 days uh, yeah, start probably, to finish. or less uh, and start to finish uh and financing part of that is because financing is so straightforward financing on, straightforward on single family homes for I mean, investors and for yeah. You know, people that are looking to to buy it, and that's the nice thing. So, with our single family homes that we own as investments right now, they could either be attractive to another investor or to the market at large. I mean, people that are looking right. to Huge to raise revenue. their home in and put roots down. And right. so, our our buyer pool, our target audience for a single family home is huge, and that's yeah. why I'm saying. That while it's not a liquid asset, I mean, right now, even even in, a, in the market we've had in the past, where we've Justin and I have been through a couple of cycles at this point, but even in a down market, single family homes that are well cared for are, are just selling. They mm-hmm. always sell. They do. Okay, so that's kind of a nice thing about the single family homes. We feel some comfort in that. Yeah. And, so uh, what what are the cons? I mean, uh, f- for me, I, I suppose when a tenant moves out, you got a vacancy. Yeah, I mean, you're going to shoulder 100% of the vacancy. You know, in 12 years of property management, there have been very 14. few. 14 years. Yeah. There have been very few times where we've had a vacancy for a very long. Yeah. And so people worry about vacancy. Should I factor in a vacancy rate? Sure, you can. That might be smart. That might be cautious and conservative. But yeah. we really haven't had to factor in a, a vacancy rate because sometimes all we can do to get one tenant to, to move and then clean the carpets and maybe do a, a couple little things and get somebody in right on top and they're just begging, can we get in? Where's the keys? Yeah. So I, I really think, you know, you, you shouldn't be too worried about uh, uh, the vacancy, the vacancy on single family homes. Yeah. 
but be prepared. I mean, we teach our investors to have a cash reserve and yes. and make sure that you've got money. You've got to pay. You've got to make that payment. You've got to be in a position to be able to make that payment and uh, take care of repairs and things like that as they come up. Right. Now, one of the cons, and I guess this is a con, is that it could be very competitive. I can't tell you how many offers we put on properties only to be beat out by, you know. Those uh, people who are just in love with the house, they see themselves barbecuing in the backyard and entertaining guests and raising their kids. About. All that emotion is going to cause them to pay more for the house maybe than what we would pay for it as an investor. And so oftentimes we're getting beat out on very well, nice properties. Well, can I tell you, there, there may be um, a little discrimination against investors in a, multi- <laughs> in a multiple offer situation because um, in, in some cases on a multiple offer uh, there are buyers submitting pictures of their family in a write-up, and here you are. You're just an investor, and yeah. you're going to turn this into a rental. So there's a little bit of that too. Well, there's that, but also people don't want to leave their neighbors living next to a rental property. And by and the way, so, investors are not a protected class, so you, I suppose you could discriminate against them. Yeah, I mean they don't want the home to become a rental property. No, Maybe the yard go to they fear pot that. and that kind of thing. So. But we love single family homes. But again, if somebody came to me with a, a, a an opportunity to invest in a condo and it looked really good, uh, I would invest in that condo. We've got one on the table right now that, that we could consider. Yeah, and we've done, deal. and like I say, we've had stuff in property owners associations and things like that where we're dealing with the homeowner associations and, and a community and that kind of thing. And so we have invested in those in the past, but you always just need to go in eyes wide open in that. So let's talk about the last one. And again, there's lots of different things we could be talking about today, but we're trying to just focus in on a few things that basic investors, beginner investors could get into. Now, commercial is our next section. That may be reserved for for maybe not your first purchase. Yeah, you know, it's not maybe maybe not a a first time investment. So in two thousand seven, Jared and I bought a lot here on State Street. We want to be on State Street. It's a good place to be here in Orem, and um, uh, we picked up a a funny little lot here, and we developed uh, this building. And uh, it's a nice building, fifty five hundred square feet. It's a multi tenant building, so we have experience owning commercial and uh, multi-unit building. And Jared, has it been a kind of a pain in the butt? Um, I think time, is, I say time will tell. This has been 11 years as we've been in this building. <laughs> I think it's going to be a big piece of our uh, retirement. Yeah. Uh, but yes, it has been a little challenging and there are some reasons for that and we'll maybe get to that. Has it been our best investment? In other words, had we invested the same amount of money in other types of properties that we just talked about, would we have been would we have done better? Probably, yeah, uh, probably. But um, let's talk about a couple of the pros. Sure. I mean, one of the nice things is is that it's not uncommon for on uh, a commercial tenant to sign a three year, four year, five year lease. Right. Uh, people, uh, especially those that have established businesses, they don't, they're not mobile. They want to be in the same location. People can count on them being there. So that's good. Now, higher income potential is, is good. I mean, a lot of commercial owners are making a lot of money on these properties. Well, more risk, more reward yeah. is really what it comes exactly. down to. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the nice thing is you get great tenants because – they come here from eight to six, and you know they're respectful. They're not living here. They're not cooking here. They're not showering here. Yeah, <laughs> so you get pretty good, high quality. They're tenants. definitely motivated. It's a business relationship. Yeah, they're motivated to keep the place clean because yeah. they have customers right. coming in and out, for example. And so they're not gonna. Uh, it's not gonna be trashy. And you know, if they've got a problem, that's generally you're gonna get that call during the day. On residential, you know, I've gotten calls two o'clock in the morning. I don't can't tell you how many times. Or on holidays, Christmas Day, you know, that sort of thing. And so those are really good. Now, triple net leases is where the what what the landlord or the owner gets is just that rent. And so you put on the shoulders of the tenant or in the lease rather, uh, maybe a, a portion of the taxes or all the taxes, depending on what the commercial building is. Uh, they're going to pay all the utilities. They're going to do all the maintenance. They're going to, you know, so the cleaning, the cleaning and things like that. They're paying for all of that. Mm-hmm. And so what the owner is receiving is a check in the mail that yeah. is basically their profit. Right. And so from a management standpoint, if you get good tenants in there, it, it really is a breeze. You know, the, some of the cons um, that we should talk about uh, is you do have some, you have some public safety concerns. Yeah. Uh, we talk 
all the time about liability. Jared we and I have umbrella policies. We have We're policies on insured. all of our all of our properties. Uh, we just can't take that too seriously. Yeah, when you've got people coming in and out of your parking lot, and uh, in the, obviously we have uh, winters here in Utah, and, and ice is over, and if we're not uh, really diligent. diligent about clearing ice, even out on our sidewalks, we've got a lot of people coming by on the sidewalks. We've got a bus stop outside of our uh, mm-hmm. business out there. You know, if we're not careful, we could open ourselves up to some real liability there. Um, you know, another con again is just a bigger initial investment. Um, and you know, there is a potential for some expensive maintenance costs. I mean, our heating systems, our cooling systems and things like that in this building, our roof Mm -hmm. is way more expensive to fix, to repair, to maintain, uh, black top, things like that. Very expensive. Anything attached to commercial and (laughs) where you need to use contractors that are commercially licensed and insured. It costs more money. How about the real estate taxes on a commercial building? <laughs> yeah, that's a big one. I mean, they're huge. They're 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 huge because you don't get that residential exception, and so we are writing a big check every year to the to the county for taxes. So I think that's you well, know kind of a con there. But yeah, you got to have your rents high enough, obviously, to uh, cover all of these things. And you definitely in commercial, you factor in a vacancy rate. We've had uh, vacancies for months at a time, and we have. it's it's really killed us. It's hurt us. Yeah. Uh, on uh, this commercial building. Yeah, I mean, I think there's some some real volatility in the commercial leasing market with, um, you know, depending on the economy, depending on uh, job growth, the uh, uh, optimism of of, uh, business owners and things like that. Uh, You know, you've got some some challenges there to fill some leases sometimes. Well, commercial is interesting. I mean, it's not just office buildings. It's retail. It is industrial. It's uh, warehouse. Warehouse. And and technically, anything in the multi-unit arena is technically a sure. commercial property as well. Can, yeah. I, can I add two more properties, uh, two more uh, subjects here? And I'll, well, we can be brief on them. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know why we don't have land on here. You and I, uh, our family, my, our dad is a big land guy. He's yeah, so but I well. tried to. I was trying to keep to uh, <laughs> things that produce a monthly <laughs> and revenue. That, stream, and that's one but. of the cons of land is it does not produce any kind of a, a cash flow for you. But we've, we've yeah. we have benefited by land. Our family has. Jared and I are speculating on a couple of pieces yeah. of land. Uh, so maybe we'll say that for another podcast, but can I add one more? Sure. Recreational. Okay. We could because talk about... We have we, seen some great you know appreciation we, on recreational properties, which would tie into VRBO yeah. and, and... We Airbnb. could. We could add to this subject uh, short-term rentals, yeah. which we've we've been dabbling in and have has, yeah. had some experience Well, in. we just built our dream cabin. It took us two and a half years to build, and we absolutely love it. And uh, I'll tell you, we we built that right. The market's gone up. So, again, when we talk about real estate investing, anything's on the table. Let's save those for another podcast because those are two two subjects that I think we're we really could get. About. We could talk about Airbnb one time uh, in short term rentals. We've had uh, we've got a very nice property down in Hurricane Utah, right by Santa Hollow yeah. Reservoir, and uh, we could give you some some uh, perspective, I guess, on that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I just, we we just, we love to invest in real estate. And a big part of our business has been helping people develop their own portfolio, to develop their, their build their own portfolio and And making it easy to own real estate, making it really easy to own real estate. And so one of the things that's really unique about us is that we have that property management piece. Yeah. Uh, And so when, what we've been able to do is help people buy their first property, and then put that property into our property management system after closing. Right, And we've made it owning real estate easy. I mean, we really have. And so these people then are more comfortable in once they get the funds ready for another property, come back to us and say, hey, I'm ready for property number two. Yeah. And so with the perspective of being having the property management piece to it, knowing what properties look uh, like in terms of being a good rental or not, yeah. really important what they're going to rent for, what kind of challenges, what kind of renovation we need to do to make it rent ready. I mean, that's perspective that you and I have that, I mean, there's maybe a, a handful of our 
colleagues that, and we of course are always in touch with them in this valley that can do what we can do in terms of helping people develop their real estate portfolio. Well, I think you know a lot of real estate agents want to sell you an investment property, and, of course. and they're shooting from the hip on what the rents are, and they always inflate those values because they're not stuck managing that property. They Their make relationship a sale is and, done and is at done. the sale. Yeah, and so we're so careful on on setting the uh, you know the expectation of what a property is going to rent for, how well it's going to rent, and of course just picking out the right property in the first place, and then we're going to live with you yeah. for the long term. We've got a long term relationship, and we want it that way because again. We want people to repeat that process. And they should. Not not for our benefit, but for their benefit. Yeah. They yeah. need to develop that. Yeah. So if you're looking for uh, some real estate investing advice, you want some more education on yeah. real estate investing, we're happy to have uh, maybe a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Mm -hmm. We're going to put out some more content relating to real estate investing. Um, but if you're ready, give us a call. We'll help you get started. Yeah. We've got the expertise, the knowledge, the team to uh, uh, get you started on this path and and really create wealth. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Justin, I've been selling real estate for a long time and we've made a lot of money in sales commissions. Yeah. But where where we've become wealthy and, dare I say, rich is real estate investing. Yeah. And uh, what we've done with those sales commissions and what we could help you do with, with uh, income. the income that you have. Mm -hmm. So thanks for tuning in. I hope you found this helpful. Uh, always uh, feel free to reach out, contact us and interact with us. We're here to help out.